Welcome back to the classroom. My name is Mr. Wong. Today we're going to be covering module 8 from the universe to the atom. Inquiry question 2, the structure of the atom. And we're going to be investigating Chadwick's discovery of the neutron. We're going to be looking at all the different experimental evidence that led to the discovery of neutron. And we're going to look specifically at Chadwick's method that he used. And also the scientific understandings, scientific laws that he used to implement these ideas together. You can find your textbook readings there. Just a bit of context to s so you know where everyone is related. Ernest Rutherford was the person who came up with the positive nucleus of the atom. He was the teacher of James Chadwick and Chadwick essentially discovered the neutron. Obviously through evidence of his own and obviously from other scientists as well. Just to give you a bit of context when we compare the pair, the proton, the neutron, proton plus one charge has the exact same charge number as an electron, but obviously different polarity, it's positive. Neutron, neutral charge, given in the first name, you can indicate the neutral. The other thing we know is their masses are relatively similar. The neutron is just slightly more heavy, uh, but virtually much the same. The proton, because it is a charged particle, can be affected by or will be affected by a magnetic and electric field. The neutron, its main function is actually to hold the nucleus together. It actually exerts a force that we call the strong nuclear force. So. It exerts a thing called the strong nuclear force and that's the thing that holds the nucleus together because as you imagine if your nucleus has a lot of positive charges okay there's bound to be some kind of repulsive force occurring because these are all uh, similar charges or same charges same sign the neutron effectively exerts a force of attraction that overpowers the electrostatic repulsion and that's why we have our nucleus okay let's look at some things about the Rutherford's model we did talk about some good points and some bad points in our previous lesson so I'm just gonna go through them again in different contexts so we know that the atom is neutral overall and that's well explained by his model because he showed that the reason why it is neutral is the number of negative charges of electrons is equal to the number of positive charges or well, at least we know that they must have balanced out what his model couldn't explain is if the nucleus is indeed positive why aren't these protons repelling against each other like i just said just then right if we have a group of positive charges stuck really close to each other then technically, according to the electrostatic forces, they should be repelling away from each other. So why didn't that not happen? They didn't know. The next was the atomic mass number is twice that of the atomic number. So if we look at carbon as the main example, if you have a look here, um, the atomic mass here we have is 12. The atomic number we have is 6. Now we know that the atomic number is contributed by the number of protons okay the mass number though is the combination of protons and neutrons they didn't know the neutrons existed at that point but we couldn't work out why the um, atomic mass was that much larger than the atomic number that we were seeing there okay all of that kind all right Rutherford actually came up with the hypothesis that a set of protons and electrons have actually combined. So this explains the extra mass, but also why the net charge isn't affected. Essentially what we were saying here. And he coined this extra mass, the neutron, okay? So he came up with the hypothesis, but obviously he didn't have any experiments to prove the existence of the neutron here. That wasn't his role. So just to recap, Rutherford's model of the atom was to have these electrons um, 
in sort of a surrounding area of the nucleus. We also know that he had the nucleus as a positively densely packed nucleus. Okay, and he came up with the idea that this so-called neutron was caused by the doubling up of some protons and some electrons. So that was his idea. Okay, so just to recap, the neutral proton electron double, uh, that was predicted the difference in the mass and atomic number due to this neutron. There was predictions that the neutron would have a similar mass to the proton and it was formed when the proton and electron were joined together. Now the reason why this was the case because beta decay, now if you recall beta decay is, I'll just write this down, beta decay is the release of electrons uh, within a nuclear um, fission reaction. Okay could be fusion as well, or radioactive decay, let's just say that, uh, was already well known. Okay, Hence the proposal of the electron-proton pair had quite a lot of support at the time when it was proposed. Now, quantum theory would say no to Rutherford's idea. Um, let me just explain why. So quantum theory suggested that the energy involved in maintaining the electron in the nucleus combined with a proton or not was so large that it would make all the nuclei unstable and unable to exist. Okay, so the energy calculations would say that this idea of Rutherford wouldn't be possible. Uh, from the atomic spectra, uh, we also saw some inconsistencies with the idea of a proton-electron proposal, because uh, a nuclear electron would produce hyperfine splitting in spectral lines of elements, no, none were observed. What we mean by hyperfine splitting, imagine you saw an emission spectra of a specific wavelength and you see these sort of really pronounced lines. Now hyperfine splitting is when, let's just say in this particular spectra here, instead of seeing one sort of distinct line, we see a lot of other little mini lines next to it. So if we did have these kind of nuclear electrons, electrons inside that nucleus, we'd see this kind of transition, but that's not observed, okay? So that must suggest that this nuclear electron does not exist. This is where we have some follow-up experiments to actually try and observe what's inside the nucleus. We have a... Um, scientist pair called Booth and Becker. Uh, I think this is actually just the uh, photo of Becker. I couldn't find Booth. And then we have Curie and Joliot. Um, Curie, this lady here is actually the daughter of Madame Curie, the lady who uh, I think won no two Nobel Prizes and was seen as a discovery of radiation and all that. So really intelligent mother and daughter pair that we have there. Okay, let's look at the first um, experiment done by B and B. So they got a radioactive isotope, polonium two one or two one zero, which was well known to give off alpha particles during its decaying nucleus. So what we actually know, and we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, is really massive nucleus will tend to undergo alpha decay. Okay, these alpha particles, remember, gives off basically a helium nucleus, nuclei. So in technical terms, that's two protons and two neutrons. Obviously, we don't know at that point it was two neutrons as well, but that's the idea of the alpha particle there. So we have all these alpha particles streaming in and hitting this beryllium sheet of metal. Okay, what he detected was some kind of radiation that came out during that collision. So at some point when the alpha particles collided with the beryllium machine, it caused an emission of these radiation forms here. Okay, so that's what we see. 
Right, so what was happening here? Why did we use specific materials and what were we seeing here? So by bombarding a beryllium sheet, which is really light element with uh, energetic particles, alpha particles emitted by the radioactive polonium, what we ended up seeing was really highly energetic and penetrating radiation. That's what they called it at the time. And we also worked out, or the reason why they also thought it was some form of radiation was that it was uh, there was no electric charge, meaning by if you put a electric field or magnetic field next to it, it didn't seem to alter the course or movement of these um, radiation. Uh, I'll just use radiation because they didn't know it was neutrons at the time just yet. And they also worked out that it was more penetrating than gamma rays, meaning by it can go through a lot more materials, a lot more dense materials than gamma rays. Then we have Curie and her husband, and they added a different sort of, they added a little extra component of this experiment. So they followed the same method at the start. You had the polonium 210 hitting whatever metal it is, doesn't really matter at this point. And then they added an additional component, which was power film wax sheets. What they worked out was when this unknown radiation collided with this parafilm wax sheet, it would inject or eject protons. And now this is actually quite useful to do it this way. The reason why you can do it this way is you can actually use the law of conservation energy and the law of conservation of momentum to do some really clever calculations. Okay, Remember what the fundamental laws state that whatever you have before, so whatever energy you have before should equal the energy after and whatever momentum you have before, well, we can do the sum, is also the same after here. So you might not know what the radiation is, this radiation here, you might not know if it has any mass or not, but I know the mass of protons. Okay, I know I can measure how fast they're moving. Then I can work out energy. I can work out the momentum. Then using the conservation laws, I can work backwards. I can actually trace backwards to work out if this has mass. We can work out how much energy was being released by the individual radiation components. So that's a really clever way of going about it, working backwards using the laws of conservation. Okay, And they actually found some really interesting things. Now firstly, I just want to quickly explain why they use power from wax. Um, because the power from actually has really uh, densely amount of um, protons, so hydrogen atoms, and you could release those protons out really nicely. They concluded that it could not be gamma rays. Now, originally people, they thought um, that it would be gamma rays. Obviously, one, it was more penetrating than gamma rays. But two, it would actually violate the law of conservation of energy. Okay, what they actually worked out is with the alpha particles, it would give off about every individual alpha particle, would give off about five mega electron volts of energy when it collided with the beryllium sheet. If it then went to the power film wax and then we measured the energy on the protons, it would also have uh, 5 mega electron volts. That's what they detected. So that's consistent there. But if it were gamma rays, they predicted that it would be about 50 mega electron volts. Now, you can see an issue here. Um, so these two are consistent with each other. But you can see that's not consistent there, and that's not consistent there, if it were gamma rays. okay? Meaning by what that ex essentially tells us is it cannot be gamma rays because we violate the law of conservation of energy. And we need to, if it were the case, obviously that meant that we had to generate a lot of energy from somewhere, and then a lot of energy somehow disappeared afterwards, which, you know, wouldn't make much sense. And then along the lines, at some point, a guy named James Jatwick, um, here he is, 
I came and did a little bit additional to that experiment and also built on Rutherford's work. So you can see this is the exact same experiment that he did. Okay. Again, he did the exact same thing. There were a couple of additional experiments that he did do to work out the nature of the neutron here. So this is quite nicely portraying everything we're seeing. You have the, I'll just wait for this back, alpha particle colliding to beryllium. That neutron collides with power film and that gives you the proton. So that's his setup there. Okay. What he found, obviously, was the exposure of an electric field and magnetic field didn't change the path of this neutron. Okay, so what we could deduce is um, it's not charged. Okay, we say it's not a charged particle, but that doesn't mean it can't be a particle, it just means it, there's no charge. But that was the original idea of why they thought it were gamma rays. Okay, so you can imagine it going through there. All right. Obviously, it did not do this. The other thing that he found in the experiment was if it was radiation, it should technically uh, cause photo emission. So the photoelectric effect should occur. But if you expose this radiation at the time that they called it uh, on a piece of metal, there was no photo emission. So there was no photo effect observed. Okay, now this would imply that it's not gamma rays also, but also remember they thought that this was more penetrating than gamma rays, so technically it might have a greater energy or around similar energy to gamma rays. The fact that although it would have similar sort of energy of uh, penetration, it still didn't emit any electrons, that would imply that we're not dealing with radiation here. Okay. And then the next came with a proposal of some type of mass of the neutron. So when the neutron collides with the power film, uh, the power film is rich in hydrogen atoms. Um, and if you replace it with anything else, uh, you could still see the same thing. The protons being ejected, this is how he explained it. This means that the unknown radiation had a significant momentum. In order for this radiation to displace the proton, obviously it means that some incredible amount of momentum was transferred into the individual protons to eject it. And we know that momentum is a characteristic of particles uh, and not waves. Well, at least at the time that they thought um, particles were... A mom a momentum was the thing that relate to things with mass and things that relate to mass were particles. Okay, so what he later found uh, through uh, the following nuclear reaction, if you have beryllium and you eject or if you uh, whack it with some alpha particles onto the carbon sheet, okay, based on the law of conservation of mass, the unknown radiation source must have similar atomic mass as the proton okay as you can see there so hence the following equation was developed okay so you, if you can see the conservation of mass here we have nine here we have four here so the end product should have a total the total mass or the total mass number should equal to 13 okay so whatever we have we have 12 here, that means we have one additional mass number required. And he basically coined this as the particle, the neutron. Okay. He also proposed the fact that it's neutrally charged, obviously because it's not affected by electric fields, magnetic fields. And also, another additional point I guess you could say here was there is no photoelectric effect seen when this was exposed to the metal sheets. Okay, so let's just kind of recap everything that he talked about and all the different evidence we've seen with the discovery of the neutron. So if we met through the measurements of velocity, it could be determined that the ejected protons had an energy of about 5.3 mega electron volts 
This was inconsistent with gamma rays, which was predicted to have 50 mega electron volts. So this would violate the law of conservation of energy, as you would have to find additional energy uh, to get these um, gamma rays injecting the protons. Through the conservation of momentum, Chadwick worked backwards from the proton's momentum to determine the mass of the neutron. He concluded the mass of this particle was similar to protons, however, it had no charge. Okay. And what you should also take into account is the fact that other things, other observations we see was there was no photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect. Okay. And also no photoelectric effect and it also was not affected by electric fields or magnetic fields. Okay, so the fact that it's not affected by electric fields would mean that it's not consistent with the idea that it is radiation, not consistent with idea it is radiation. So that could imply that um, it's not affected by electric field magnetic fields because there's no charge. But it did have mass because it was consistent with conservation of momentum and it was consistent with the conservation of energy if this radiation they thought was something of mass, hence we call it the neutron. So it has the same mass as a proton, it's neutrally charged. And that's how we actually came up with this idea and the discovery of the neutron based on these scientific laws and based on his experiment and also these other experimental observations. So that's what you need to know. You need to know the experimental observations he's seen and also how these uh, conservation laws helped him come up with this conclusion there. Okay. So let's just quickly summarize everything we know of. Firstly, we know that Chadwick did this experiment in the 1932s. Uh, he found that it was a neutral particle with a mass similar to a proton. We now know that it was using alpha particles uh, directed at beryllium that caused the emission of neutron. We know that this would mean that the parafilm block would displace any protons. And that was the detection. And by using the conservation of momentum as the neutrons collide with the protons, we could work out the mass. Um, and we can also work out, you know, that it wasn't gamma rays. The reason why neutrons are hard to detect is because they have no charge. So they don't really interact with a lot of the electric field, uh, magnetic field experiments that we do there. Okay. So that ends our lesson for today. That really basically concludes everything you would need to know about the discovery of the neutron. Once again, thank you for joining us or joining myself with this lesson. This actually concludes the inquiry two section of this module. So thank you so much for joining in the classroom today. And I'll see you next time when we talk about the quantum model of the atom. So take care.